Dean Carlin is one of my very favorite behavioral scientists. I think uh, honestly the most, the boldest, most uh, creative and energetic uh, researcher. I love his Halloween study. I love the random assignment study. Not exactly, but to religion, like, yeah. So uh, really exciting stuff. And um, Dean is presenting a talk that he has never done before. So I think we could call this the world debut of the following talk. So Dean, thank you for joining us. The admiration is mutual, Angela. I, that's exactly how I'd have described you. So there you go. <laughs> um, so thank you everybody. It's, and thank you for inviting me. This is a, um, this has been a, actually a very long term effort here. I think we started this project maybe five years ago, four years ago, um, with an effort to get tons and tons of experiments doing messaging on savings. Um, in the end, we have six to share. We actually had a little inside bet, which I know I lost on how many experiments we were gonna manage to pile into this process. Um, I think my bet, was, my number was somewhere around 20. So, um, but um, so overall though, let me talk first a bit of more theoretically about what is it we're trying to do. Um, as we know, you know, at people, at you know, many of the people in the in the audience, the panelists, the other panelists, the organizers, uh, there's a lot of effort around the world to increase savings. And I think it helps to just speak for a moment about what we mean by undersaving, because implicitly, if we're doing something to try to encourage more savings, it's because we think that there's undersaving. So what is undersavings? And here's one of my favorite lines from The Simpsons about one that undersavings is not. So Mr. Burns. Dean, um, this could just be me, but I'm not sure I can see your slides. Oh, weird. Oh, 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 you know what? It's because when you had me turn off the share screen, I didn't put it back on. Ah. Okay, good. But I'm glad I interrupted you. So tricky. There we go. Thank you for interrupting. No, Perfection. no. Perfection. No. <laughs> that you. would have been bad. Eventually you would have come in. <laughs> but look at this graph. This graph is great. Um, so Montgomery Burns and, and Homer Simpsons. And, and Homer Simpson says to Mr. Burns, you're the richest man I know. And what does Montgomery say back? He goes, yeah, but I'd give it all up in a moment for just a little bit more. So, um, so that's, I think, you know, it, it's, it's obviously just intended as humor, but the, the point is very simple, which is by under saving, we don't just mean, oh, you know, people want more savings. So if you went to a bunch of people and you asked them, like, would you like more savings? Of course they say, I want more savings, right? A little bit more. So what does it mean when we say under saving? And, and it's not something that's easy to elicit. Like if you go and do a survey and say to someone, what, what savings balance would you, do you have? What would you like to have? Oh gosh, you would like more? Well, then you're under saving. Eh, that's not really a very good way of thinking about it because who wouldn't say yes to that? Um, in, in, the, in the kind of simplest way of thinking about it, I would define it as, you know, in an ideal world of perfect information and perfect decision-making and perfect markets, are you trading off current consumption with future consumption at the right ratio such that you're putting a right aside the optimal amount of money for your plans for life and current? And that's a loaded sentence. You can't put that into a survey. So what, do, what is it that we mean is we often get into the, to the weeds of these various biases or market failures that might be taking place that lead people to save less than that very kind of complicated sentence that I just said. Um, and so I think about things as either on demand side or supply side, because I am an economist. And on demand side, we have individual decision making failures, which is a large part of where the, you know, I think the, the research space has been focused. There might be social constraints. This is very prevalent in developing countries, we tend to think, where uh, people might save less because they really won't have access to that money in the future. Think about a woman who doesn't have power over the resources. So if she has cash in hand right then, she might not. Um, have really incentives to save because it might get um, absconded by somebody else. Um, and paternalism, which is not, not, I put yikes there because that's, you know, if, if, if that's what we're resorting to is paternalism, where we're just saying as people, um, you know, kind of working with banks and financial institutions and government, we just think people should save more than they already are. That's, that's probably not a, a, if that's your residual argument, that's probably the wrong argument. Um, on the supply side, there could be issues with, with banks, prudence issues, 
um, that are hopefully solvable. There could be fixed costs and transaction costs to the way savings are, are able to be collected. And so those are kind of outside the space of what we're dealing with, but they could be very real hindrances that, that drive up the price of savings. But when we focus on individual decision-making, which is the focus obviously of most people in the audience, I'm guessing, and, and the focus of where I'm gonna go, um, there's a lot of different reasons we talk about. There's temptation, models of dual self or hyperbolic are kind of the standard models we go to, but there's other issues too that, that are just as, you know, we don't really have reasons to think that we should be putting so much um, emphasis on just the, the temptation dual self models. There could be false optimism, um, poor recurring information on your future risks and needs. Um, it also could just be about attention. And if it's about attention, then it helps to get a little bit more specific, I think, about what, what do we mean by attention? Is it about attention to the task of saving? Is it about attention to future needs? Is it about attention to future income? Um, so um, ultimately, we also have this conundrum in this space. And I think this is true of a lot of messaging. And frankly, a lot of behavioral experiments that we see, I think, have a, the, a very simple conundrum, which is, are we trying to tackle the root cause of a problem or improve the outcome? So the prior slide I showed you is all about, you know, kind of putting forward some ideas that hopefully help us understand the root cause of the problem. And then in kind of this ideal way of thinking about policy and theory and how they intersect, we'd like to think that we then write policies that are very specifically tackling the theory of what's causing the problem. Right? And in a sense, we'd like to think if we can do that, if we can solve the root cause, then voila, everything will work nicely. The practical approach is to say, eh, just solve the damn problem. And this is where I, you know, we were joking about earlier, Angela, I think this sentence does not work without saying the word damn. <laughs> so apologies to the future of the internet. Um, so I think about, the, you know, what do I mean by this? Let me give you a very simple example outside of the context of savings, um, food transfers. A lot of times we see, particularly in low income countries, um, food transfers of nutritional supplements. Now, there might be some reasons to do that that are about markets, but there's also oftentimes a motivation of just saying, look, no, what we're trying to do is transfer nutritional food, nutritional food that's actually available to a household where, where the gap might be one about information, where the household doesn't have the kind of perfect information about what, what nutritional, um, the, the nutritional content of different food, and so children are not getting as nourished as they can. So in an ideal world, if you think the problem is about information, you would go and provide information to these households and, like, and then they would have that better information about nutritional content and voila, you solve the problem. But a lot of times that problem is not solved by nutritional information. It's solved by just saying, well, here's some better nutritional food. And, and why is that? Well, because providing information about nutritional content of food is actually really hard to do. Um, it's really hard because of um, difficulty in sending in messaging. It's, it, it's, it's like teaching anything and like, you know, not everybody learns, people understand things differently. Um, but if you just transfer the food, maybe you solve the problem. And savings, I think, is very much like that too. And we have a lot of things that we see out there where the intervention at hand is actually really not targeted to the root cause of the problem. So think about social mimicry, hey, save, everybody else is, or things like that, or emotive, trying to appeal to um, fear and things like this. That's not really getting at the root cause of potentially of the undersaving, but it might work. So let's see what happens. Okay, so that's a long way ended way of saying that a lot of the things that we're testing maybe fit into that second bin rather than attacking the root cause. So I got started doing this about 10 years ago or so. We had a, a paper that we published in Management Science and show you what we learned from that very briefly and why we ended up embarking on this project. So in this study, there was three countries, Peru, Bolivia, and the Philippines, and Bolivia and the Philippines, we sent off um, text messages, but in Peru, this is actually before the days of cell phones being prevalent enough, we sent literally physical letters to people reminding them to save. We see these um, statistically significant, but not crazy big in terms of magnitude, and that's a theme that's going to come up again. Um, treatment effects on amount saved and on reaching your, your goal. But one of the things we did find in the Peru sample only, we had this variation about whether a specific expenditure was mentioned. And it turns out that the, the, there was a big, it was a big driver of the results, but um, we didn't have that variation in the other sites. Um, and so um, this basically kind of whet our appetite, seeing that there were these kind of large average pooled results um, that I just showed you, 
um, and some what seems like heterogeneity within in terms of across sites, across methods, across content, um, got us excited, but also made us realize that if we just went and embarked on like yet one more study on this, that we would inevitably leave ourselves frustrated. And so we wanted instead to set up a, a process of just feeding in as many messaging experiments as we can, starting off with a long list of ideas to test and, and then letting each site um, be a, at the mercy of those negotiations and conversations with partners, um, not be so adamant that every site has to be like the you know, most perfectly designed experiments um, to get at specific theories, but hope that through the collection of a bunch of experiments that we can start to learn about some patterns. So we ended up after this exercise, we actually, as I mentioned earlier, fewer studies than I think we hoped for, but we still ended up with a, you know, a good number. We have six different countries. The partnerships are with financial institutions or government pension systems. They're all using SMS messaging. We only have administrative data before, during, and after. And we're going to spend a lot of the focus on the after. That's really, in a sense, what we're, what we're trying to see here is, do we generate any long-term habit formation? Um, so here's the six sites. I'm not going to go through the weeds on these. I'm going to show you one result, set of results from Columbia to just kind of whet your appetite and then launch into the rest of, rest of them. But we're not going to get into the weeds of every single experiment and all the variations within, um, partly because we have the you know 25 minutes. Um, but here's the here's the set of six, and as you can see, you know they're mostly large, except the Dominican Republic is one of the the smaller sites. Um, just as a sample of what these messages are, there's like a standard message that is just kind of, uh, in a sense, like the simplest reminder you could imagine that just kind of says, don't, for, you know, here's, here's, here's where you go to save some basic information. We have some, and we do have a, a regression, which I'll show you at the end, where we kind of coded up the, the features of messaging content in order to see whether certain types of messaging were doing better. So there's goal attention, don't forget your savings goal. There's information where that's saying, oh, you can either cash in or out, or, and here's the price. There's persuasive, where we're trying to, where it sounds a little just that, like, like more persuasive. And then there's emotive ones that, um, you know, say words like enjoy that appeal to loss aversion or fear and things like this. That's just a sample of them. So let me just whet your appetite with the Columbia one, um, but it in a sense motivates why we're doing the pool because we don't want to, you know, we don't want to get overexcited by any one result. Um, so with Columbia, with Columbia, we randomized the duration of the of the experiment, and so you have in wave one, this, the blue is the treatment effect. This is on cumulative savings, so everything's going up and working great. Um, and as you can, and then the dark blue is the messaging that um, message group that continues, and the light blue are the ones that got turned off. So the minute the messaging stopped, the savings stopped. And then wave three, more of the ones that were going turned off again, and that's this group. And then the original group that got turned off over here is still not saving. So here you get messaging impact um, when you're doing the messages and the minute they turn off, boom, it goes away. That's on active account holders. On inactive account holders, um, we basically um, don't see, you know, first of all, the, the treatment effects are much, much smaller. Um, and, um, and we do see kind of roughly the same pattern, although it just gets very, very noisy at the end. Um, whoops, I didn't mean to show that slide. I need to skip that. Um, on habit formation, um, one of the things that was striking is that the, you know, aside from the, um, sorry, I meant to skip two slides. There we go. Um, the other thing we want to show is on, on whether you include a numeric goal, we do start to somewhat see a pattern. I mean, it's weaker, but it's there for some persistence. So here's for standard savings message. And as you can see, this the dark yellow is showing the, the drop off. Those are the people that are that the messaging stops, um, whereas the the light is the ones that continue. But for numeric goals, the dark blue are the um, the ones that have stopped. And as you can see, we're still seeing positive, although weaker messages, a uh, weaker I'm sorry, weaker treatment effects. So we we see less dissipation. We do start seeing some statistically significant results. So this kind of got us excited. But at, at the end of the day, the reason why we did the the um, you know the multi sites and pulling everything in is because we you know we didn't want to let one result from one country sway us and go oh la la look we can generate long term results as long as you talk about numeric goals. So here's the um, overall specification I'm going to share from all six. We have um, here we have monthly data. 
Um, and we are basically really focusing in on two variations for this, um, for this experiment, where post is either defined as the period of time um, post the start of the experiment, so when the, when the experiment is ongoing and whether it's generating treatment effects while the messages are being received, or post means post the experiment, as in after everything is stopped. And so now in a sense, in that time period, obviously treatment and control are neither getting any messaging, but the idea is the treatment group had gotten a bunch of messages and the control group had never did. So what you're gonna see here are some, um, some really large number of digits, not, um, we're, we're probably gonna end up um, making this much lower. I don't wanna give the false illusion of precision, but the reason we're leaving it in for now is to make the, um, make the point that um, in a lot of cases we're finding statistically significant but economically meaningless um, treatment effects. Um, and we're, we're dealing with fairly low base rates. So if you think about things as a percent, um, you know, I'll show you a couple. So, so first of all, this is um, the full sample. We do a lot of the sample splits by active or inactive because it is a big driver of the, of the results. Um, and so this is a simple binary. Did you make any deposit in that month? Unit of observation here is the person month. And here's the number of savings deposits in the month. Um, we Windsorize a lot of the continuous variables. It doesn't matter. We can do it either way. Um, so if you pool all the studies, we see a, you know, we have a control group mean of 3% are making a, a savings deposit in the month. And during the inv intervention, that goes up by a little more than 10%, 0.3%. Post the invention, as you can see, it's statistically significant, but it's really tiny, right? It's 0.07 percentage points. Um, and so even as a percent, that's getting small. Um, and then same thing on number of deposits, we have about a 10% improvement, um, it goes from 0.04 number of deposits up to 0.044 basically. Um, and then post intervention, we can see complete, um, complete drop off um, uh, or, in, or at least it loses statistical significance and is also economically meaningless. Um, we do see some variation across the sites on this. Um, a lot of the positives does seem to be driven by, um, by Columbia, which is the one I just showed you a moment ago. Um, but um, but we're, gonna, we're gonna focus on the pool here for the rest. When we look at the, um, if you were active in the prior months before, we do start seeing a statistically significant post as well here. And that seems to be what's, um, 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 you know, well, both are, but you know, it, we're seeing it on both, both, both active and inactive. So on active, it's 0.5 percent. So here, the control mean is 0.31, so 31 percent. Um, and it's, you know, but it's so it's really a very small increase in terms of a proportional change, but it is statistically significant um, in terms of um, number of deposits. Same, same basic thing. When we look at inactive, so this uh, people in the prior to the invention, here's where the control mean is really, really tiny. So that's what's driving down the control mean in the, in the aggregate pooled results. And, um, and as you can see, we have a statistically significant and truly utterly meaningless um, post-intervention treatment effect of 0 0.05 um, percentage point shift. Um, so, um, so, you know, well, I'll, I'll talk more about this, but it's going to be a consistent theme of statistically significant, but not very meaningful results. Um, when we look at amount deposited, we actually do not find any, any um, positive um, and statistically significant treatment effects on total amount deposited or monthly net amount deposited as a net of withdrawals. Um, we're not seeing results on this. Um, and that's true whether we looked at those who are active, which is this table, um, and looking at that top row, or inactive. Um, um, although I guess we do have one right here, but it, it goes away post-intervention entirely on total amount uh, for the inactive. Um, showing you graphically, if you just want to see like the month by month by month, so that pools all the months in each of these two graphs. Basically, what I just showed you are the numerical numbers for this being all pooled and this being all pooled. And basically, you see um, made any savings deposit. So, you know, you see this nice statistically significant number going up and actually kind of starts going up at the end for some reason, which I don't really have a story for you on that. Um, that might be heterogeneity though across sites in terms of the duration of each site. Um, and then the minute the messages stop, as you can see, it just, it just flattens out. Um, so this is all active. I'm gonna skip the rest of these. I can come back if people wanna know, but like we have active in the three months, um, inactive in the three months, and it's, it's the same pattern throughout this. Um, this is for number of savings deposits, same basic pattern rather than the binary same basic pattern up and then flat. 
um, um, number. This is for the active borrowers. I'm sorry, active savers in the in in the pre period. Um, so positive throughout the messaging, and then flattens to zero. Um, inactive again, same pattern. Um, positive during, and then flattens down to zero. Um, so next. I'm going to show you very briefly, we're not going to get into the weeds of any one particular message, but what we basically did is we, we thought about how to categorize the different messaging by, um, by uh, the concept that they were including. And so here's a list of the different concepts, but we did it by group, um, ones that have tried to do attention, ones that are informative, ones that are persuasive, ones that are emotive. Um, and the X's just tells you which ones had experimental variation along which of these dimensions. Um, same thing also on timing. We did have variation on when they're, when they're sent and things like that. So here's a regression that basically looks at um, the overall pooled results uh, across, and the, this is any treatment, and then any treatment interacted by whether the message had one of these features to it. And as you can see, none of the features really are rising up and making a difference. Um, when we, we have this during intervention treatment effect, um, this is for made any savings deposit, and this is for the number of savings deposits, and it's the same basic pattern. We find a we find a treatment effect while the messages are happening, and then they they dissipate, and it it doesn't matter. It's not that some of these contents messaging seem to be rising up and others not. If we look at those who are active beforehand, it's the same pattern, um, and if we looked at those who are inactive, then we start seeing the post-intervention um, persists, but again, being so small as to, I think, be the, you know, the right conclusion being more or less no effect. Um, um, so then the last thing we did empirically here, and we're, and we're still working on this part, is to employ um, um, some of the algorithms from, um, from um, machine learning tools like causal forests, and to try to look for whether there's patterns of heterogeneity where maybe, you know, maybe there's some set of people for which, you know, habits would persist. Um, obviously, the, the even fancier version of this would then intersect the causal forests with these various content messaging um, experiments and see, well, you know, maybe it's not that there's certain types of people that just systematically form habits and others don't. And maybe it's not that some messaging content automatically generates habits and the others don't, but, but once we crisscross, we do. And so, you know, we do have enough data to start um, letting the kind of machine learning algorithms hunt for that. So I don't have the interaction of those two yet, but I do have just on the causal forest. And we do actually find some noticeable heterogeneity, although nothing that really rises up to, you know, big long run effects, but I'll show you what we have. So, um, basically, the way to look at these is um, the top part here is the, ad, the kind of omnibus test to tell us, did the causal forest algorithm generate a um, um, kind of reject a null hypothesis of homogenous treatment effects? And so the p-value on the differential forest prediction is the key thing to look at. And since this um, is, you know, p is less than whatever the threshold you want to use, um, this tells us that yes, in fact, we are finding heterogeneity on made any savings deposit and also on number of savings deposits. And so then when we pass this test, we then look first for just a very crude number below here to see, well, in aggregate, how big of how, how big is the heterogeneity we're finding? So what we want to do is we look at the bottom quartile of the Kate, the Kate being the conditional average treatment effect. So this is basically taking all of the people that the causal forest thinks are going to do the worst and says, well, what's the treatment effect we're actually finding on them? And what's the people that the causal forest algorithm thinks that we're gonna do the best? And what's the treatment effect on them? And as you can see, the difference goes all the way from 0.002 to, to a 1.1 percentage point increase. So that's actually starting to get pretty sizable. That's about you know, a one percentage point increase from the, from the people who are most likely to change behavior to least likely as a result of getting the messaging. And you know, that is a statistically significant difference between the top and the bottom. This is all during the intervention. Um, and so it's that selling, and the same thing when we look at number of savings deposits, the bottom quartile is really just a zero. We're finding no treatment effect on them. Um, and the top is a 1.5, I'm sorry, 0.015 increase in the number of deposits. So this is all during the intervention. Um, when we, let me skip one. When we look after the intervention, the, the, the long run results, we do not find heterogeneity anymore on the, the binary outcome. The p-value is 0.88. So we don't even, I mean, we, we don't even really, that's why this is grayed out because we really shouldn't even be looking. We don't pass the, the omnibus test for heterogeneity. On the number of savings deposits, we're 
it's just kind of squeaking there. So do as you wish in terms of interpretation, 0.106. But if you want to just kind of look and see what are we finding, you can see that it's it's mush. Uh, when we actually look at the bottom quartile to the top quartile, they're both actually negative point estimates. The you know the the the, the range between them is not you know just actually include zero. So this really is basically saying that we're not finding heterogeneity in the long run. When we look at the other two outcomes of monthly total and monthly net outcomes, we find no heterogeneity in the short run. I'm sure by short run, I mean during intervention, the, the p-value is 0.99 and 0.62. So we have no predictive power, even with all of this data, um, to find a set of people for whom are, that are increasing um, in terms of amount deposited. And then when we look at the long run, for what it's worth, we do find, again, it's just kind of squeaking in there, but you know, p-value of 0.09, where we do find in the long run on amount of total deposits. And, and then what we find is actually the bottom quartile is actually a negative point estimate, and the positive is a positive. The, the, so the difference is actually statistically significant when we look at the mean of the top versus bottom quartile. Um, so then um, so then the, oops, sorry, number of, so then the, if we want to see like who's kind of driving this heterogeneity, so we look during, this is for the during the intervention on number of deposits. Um, and we can see this is the average treatment effect on the, on the main outcome by the baseline variable, either quartiles or binary. So what this tells us is, so right here, this is young people and this is old people. And the difference, as you can see, the differences are pretty strong in terms of statistical significance. So, you know, for old people, we have a negative, average treatment effect for young people. I'm sorry, I said that backwards. Um, for This is the young people here because it's age less than or equal to 30. Um, and we're having a negative, but you know, minuscule, but still it's 10% of the control group mean. The control group mean is 0.04, and this is 0.4 percentage points. Um, not percentage points, I'm sorry. This is count, count of number of deposits. And, um, and then for older people, it's positive. Um, for female, it's positive and positive. Um, so this is female, here's male. So it is stronger for females. Um, was the account a retirement savings or pension account? We're finding a bigger effect for those than the non um, and on and on. So we're doing, we are finding some differences. It's not enough, I would say, to impose some sort of like, I don't have a grand theory for what the patterns are, but it, it's, not, it's noticeable that there are some differences um, during the intervention for what we're finding. Um, when we look after the intervention on number of deposits, which was the one that was kind of, you know, a little bit borderline, um, we do, again, we find some, some patterns here, but nothing, nothing that is like so strong as to lead to like some sort of clear policy prescription, so to speak. Um, so let me skip away from that and um, get to basically what I would say is the, the punchline. And I think I'm, I have one minute left. Is that right? 1230. Um, what do we take away from all of this? First of all, habit formation is hard. It's why it's why you guys created BCFG for um, so um, surprise, surprise. We, um, it's not you know here here's some efforts that were being that are, are very commonly done. Messaging for savings is not a is, is, you know we see this all over the world in various forms, um, and the effects we're finding are there, but they're tiny, um, and they do get even smaller post experiment. Um, you know, often zero, if not, if they are there, they're, they're really small. Um, so messaging may work, but let's not get too hyped is kind of our takeaway. Even with targeting, we're not seeing radical change. It's not like there's some identifiable group ex ante that we're finding where the results are really big and you just need to do the targeting this way, or it's not that we're finding some messaging ideas and concepts work that are just, oh, just do that. And the reason we're getting these kind of null results um, on or tiny results is because we have all these other alternative message contents that are not working so well. So that's the negative way of saying it. On the positive to say is like, look, it's easy to experiment with and it's cheap. It's just text messaging. And a lot of banks are doing this anyhow. There might be other benefits to financial institutions that are things that we're not capturing in this, like kind of cross sell, building relationships, things like this, thing, reasons that banks have and financial institutions have to be sending messaging. So while you're going to do it, um, you can generate some change. The, the percent improvements, you know, a 10% improvement in some of these outcomes, even though they're small, is not, 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 not negligible. Um, so, you know, so it's probably worth doing, um, but let's, let's not get too excited that we're going to change the world with some messaging on savings, at least. And that's my, 
I got it through mm -hmm. eleven thirty, twelve thirty. You, you nailed it. Thank there you. There we go. That was I want, did not think you, I that was awesome. That if you close the slides, we'll do Q and A, and we have lots of great questions. Um, I will also say that was a ton of information. I've been flying back and forth with the Q and A, trying to figure out what to prioritize because there's so many interesting things you talked about. And I'm going to be selfish and actually ask ask a couple of my own questions first before I get to the audience questions. Um, my first question is actually just a sort of a clarification. So early on in the talk, you talked about some of the messages that focused on saving schools and how that seemed to create some durable change. And then I felt like the main takeaway was there's no difference in depending on the content and um, what creates durable change. And it might have just been, you know, a difference in analysis strategy, but could you clarify what your interpretation is? Yeah, no, it was, um, you know, it's funny. I added the Columbia in at the very last minute because it was, um, I think the way I would interpret it is, um, you know, you do an experiment with, in one setting and you might get some results, but like the key is to see whether the, the concept consistently is working or not. Um, so, you and know, you the Columbia results was one of the earlier concept. ones we did and we got really excited. Like, oh, look at this, like adding the numerical goal really mattered, mm -hmm. right? And then, um, you know, but when we when we look across the sites at other cases that also had the goal, you know, kind of detailed, and we and we just look at it more um, kind of objectively like that, and just say all of them, then we're not finding um, as big of an effect at all. Okay, I so think I missed it, that. It's kind of like the downside. Call. It's the risk of getting too excited about any one result, particularly given that there's always these challenges of of um, mapping, you know, a simple one line sentence to a precisely stated theory. Like, let's totally, not, and you know. and rep, they're not lots of things don't replicate, so yeah. that's that's super helpful and clarifying. Mm -hmm. I, I thought you were doing different. But maybe you're in fairness, different in fairness to our Columbia results, like you know, one of the things we do need to dig in on, and we haven't yet, is really getting inside the box of what we mean by um, including the goal and goal attention, and you know, and you know, and we don't have you know even as much variation as we have, we don't have that much variation. So it's, it, it probably wouldn't be too hard to say, oh, well then the answer is just X because that perfectly explains like Columbia and not some others. And you know, to which our answer will end up being, that's that could be, that'd be great. Go, let's go test that and like, and go see in a few more settings if that delineation matters. Okay, all right, super helpful. Thank you for helping me. So let me go to audience questions. I'm gonna start with one from Max Bazerman, who you obviously know well. Um, he wants to know if you would conclude after all of this that um, the content of the message doesn't matter. And he's also curious if you think, um, you know, sort of had you opened this up as a tournament the way we often do at BCFG, you would have seen anything different. Uh, or like, do you think there was not enough heterogeneity in the messages you tested, I think is another way of putting that. Or you think this is just a general truism? That oh, I, I would, I would, I'm going to, I think he's meaning that in a much more flattering way to you guys. Um, <laughs> that, um, it's not just a question of having more variety for the sake of variety. It's a question of having built a process of feeding off of the creative energies of lots of people. And um, so um, I, you know, I wouldn't conclude that the content doesn't matter in this, but I would say that it's clear that there's not like where, um, you know, there's not a, there's not such a clear pattern that I actually know what to say, right? I mean, most of the content that we, as we coded it didn't seem to matter. Now, when someone can always do is, you know, there are going to be some sub treatments in some countries which mattered. And it could just be that we like, you know, nailed the implementation of that concept in that site better than than in the others and so like i'm a little hesitant to say the content doesn't matter since it, like in some sense it has to somewhat matter because the messaging does actually generate a treatment effect during the the course of the of the experiment like it just it dissipates over time so it, in some sense the content must matter but it it uh, um but it but we're not finding like super clear patterns that are that are helpful in illuminating um as for, you know, we, we have thought about doing that. And actually I would love to talk with you guys. I'm a, li I'm a little uh, on whether, you know, whether we have the sample size to open that up in that way. Um, you know, it certainly would be exciting. I think there's, what we have found at least with these is was that, you know, a lot went into the negotiations on each and every one. And, and, they, and we really had that many um, treatment arms within each individual study to be able to do too much. And so, I do fear that it would be that in your guys setting, you guys have many, many more 
units of randomization to then feed let lots of people feed off of whereas i think in our setting we would have ended up like if we opened it up in that way i think everybody might have been frustrated because in the end we might have only been able to do like four treatments or something so i don't know but i do want to explore this because there are i think as we're seeing fintech increase and as we're seeing things like mobile money and overseas we are seeing a lot more windows for massive studies as compared to when we started this effort five years ago hooray for that um, okay, so uh, there's a number of questions that have come in about uh, trying to make sense of the differences in different settings. We already talked a little bit about the Columbia results and my confusion regarding that. So um, let me sort of pull a couple of questions, one from Peter Huang, another from um, Jen Gia. Peter wants to know if you have theories about why the Dominican Republican, oh, Dominican Republican, the Dominican Republic had negative effects. And um, Jen is wondering, uh, if you think sort of localized messaging might make a difference, if you think there's differences across contexts, you, I think you know this better than anyone in the world. I'm curious. <laughs> no, I think I know less about this than I, I think. Um, look, I, I, the short answer is we don't, I, I, you know, we were definitely baffled by, let me highlight the one that we we're talking about is the Dominican Republic, um, where we had this negative effect um, right here. Uh, and the short answer is no, we had, uh, like, we were, you know, needless to say, we were disappointed, you know, we were doing these, you know, I'll admit we have the, we have a human side of this, we're not merely social scientists who seek to know answers, uh, um, as much as we aspire for that kind of objectivity. Um, the fact is, we like it when things work, you know, we're, we are, we are trying to do our part in the world as well. And it's, you know, what motivates a lot of um, why we're doing this research in the first place. Um, it's not just intellectual curiosity and adherence to scientific process. So um, it's one of the reasons why I like experiments is because you, um, you, you, you're less, not perfectly, but less subject to um, um, you know, judgment on, on how you analyze things. Um, I, I don't have an answer for why it was negative though. Like um, we just don't, and this, look, this is one of the downsides of administrative data experiments, I'll admit. Um, as much as we love the large data and the ability to do things like that are kind of real and it's at scale like this. Um, the fact is we just, um, I, I don't have any story for you whatsoever as to why it's negative. I would also say it, look, it's not statistically significant and negative. It's just, um, you know, it's just the point estimate happens to be negative. So I, I would actually just treat that. Oh, I guess we have one little star over here, but realistically, I would just call this a, a, a null effect. Um, you know, that's kind of my similar answer. It's not like, like the minute, look, look, our attempt at trying to get at the differences across places is, um, you know, the minute we was done mostly about with this result here, where we, where we were looking at the variation that's kind of content, um, you know, it's, you know, if we wanted to start thinking about, you know, quantifying the, you know, kind of the culture of a country, um, let's remember that we only have six countries. And so um, I, that, that's not gonna be a very well identified analysis. And, um, um, and you know, we can't run a regression on six observations because we would actually, I think by the time we finish pooling these with a few other studies, we would violate one of my golden rules of paper writing, which is thou shalt not have more co-authors than observations. <laughs> So, so we absolutely refuse to run a regression of, the six, of our six point estimates on our, on our countries and on features at the country level. Fair enough. Although and unfortunately that's gonna that just tie our hands. Like I, I think the most we can yep. ever do is, is like some crazy hand-waving statements about, um, about macroeconomic conditions and things like that. I assume, I assume some of these questioners, myself included, were hoping or wondering if you had more insight from survey data or some other source. It sounds like, it sounds like no. Which no, is, and keep in keep in mind, even if we did, I would be a, I, I'd be a, I, I, I'd be a little bit, so, so first of all, we had no survey data on our sample. So if we had survey data from the country to use, it would be something like some um, LSMS, which is a World Bank survey that's representative of of countries um, and things like this. And then there'd be all these questions about whether we really had um, you know our sampling because they were clients of a bank and how they're different. So. Um, so needless to say, we've never gone down that path of um, trying to kind of parameterize country level features um, totally using survey data. 
Let me let me sneak in another one. Um, this is a, I'm going to read this one. This is from Susanna Burkauer. Um, Susanna says, hey, Dean, great to see you. I'd love to see these estimates put in the context of how much folks would actually realistically save. Presumably, they have a fixed income and some minimum daily expenditure for things like food. So your treatment effect is really capped at the gap between these, um, which is what is the max of what's available for them to realistically save. And she she's wondering if you have thoughts on that, if you have evidence on, I mean, that, that might be another way of thinking, I guess, about cross country, if there's differences in that sort of maximum feasible based on what you know about the populations. Right. So I think the key there would be, um, so one thing just note is when we did do dollars, everything was PPP adjusted. So in, in theory, things are, you know, kind of just that are being, being adjusted for whatever the, um, you know, the cost of living differences are across countries so that things are kind of comparable in that way. Um, what we don't have is, you know, we don't have income data on anybody. This is just the admin data. We have prior balance. That would be the closest proximate, you know, thing we have that would get it something that would give us a sense of, of resources. Um, and I'll jump to the end here. So if we have, um, if we look at that, what we can see, which is partly somewhat getting it at your question, Susanna, not, not directly, but it's related. Um, when we look at let me see. So any deposit, for instance. So we look at initial account balance. And what we see here is that people at the highest quartile of initial account balance, that's they actually have a much weaker treatment effect. So we are, I mean, keep in mind, this is still only 0.2 percentage points on the binary. Um, but it, the effect is being driven by people at the at who have lower initial account balances. So that's a bit encouraging in terms of in terms of you know targeting of the poor and things of this nature. Um, and, um, and it's a, you know, similar, it's not as stark the difference if we look at the amount deposited in the month before the intervention. So if we look at that as a, again, it's just, a, it's just getting at a proxy for you know, income or assets and things like this and poverty. Um, it's, the, it's the crudest and simplest, but the only path we have to having individual level data on, on, on their income, et cetera. And so we're seeing the same pattern that it is um, I'm, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. This one is the other way around. <laughs> so on this one, we're finding bigger treatment effects on the people who deposited more in the prior month, but we're finding bigger treatment effects on the people whose initial balance was smaller. So there you go. I have no idea what to say about that. Well, it sounds like hopefully <laughs> this will spur lots more research. It's always good when it yeah. opens questions instead of closing the door on something that's this interesting, I guess. Maybe that's that's my silver lining. I see Angela is back and I know she wants to thank you too. This was great. And I know she's going to preview next week, but we really appreciate you sharing this fresh data with us. And you know. Dean, you're like a one nope. person BCFG, like you run. <laughs> no, let's, we should talk. Let's, I, there, we should do more of these overseas. There's a lot more windows talk. now, I think with mobile money. Completely agree. Okay, so Dean, okay. I hope you join us next week when Marissa Sharif, who is in marketing here at um, at University of Pennsylvania, Wharton, um, when she gives a talk on leveraging flexibility to increase goal persistence, and that'll be a week from today. Thank you, Dean. Looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you, Dean. This was great. Thanks, thank you. Everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.